gap in England, but Jonathan, it will slow down I'm over gonna, April. I'm going to have to uh, interrupt you now. We have the Prime Minister accompanied by Chris Whitty and Professor Patrick Valance. Good afternoon and welcome to this press conference on what has been a big day for many of us, with the first chance to see friends and family outdoors, whether as six people or two households. And I want to congratulate the members of Ilkeston Cycling Club in Derbyshire that set off at midnight, uh, the swimmers who broached the chilly waters of the Hillingdon Lido at the crack of dawn, and more than anything, I know how much it will have meant to millions of people to have joined someone else for a cup of tea in the garden. And I must stress that it's only because of months of sacrifice and effort that we can take this small step towards freedom today and we must proceed with caution. It's, it's great to see that yesterday we recorded the lowest number of new infections for six months. Deaths and hospital admissions across the UK are continuing to fall. But that wave is still rising across the channel and it's inevitable as we advance on this roadmap, that there will be more infections and unavoidably more hospitalizations and sadly, more deaths. So what we need to do is to continue flat out to build the immunity of our population, build our defenses against that wave when it comes. And now that we've vaccinated more than 30 million adults across the United Kingdom, it's more vital than ever that we protect the most vulnerable. The evidence seems pretty clear that vaccinating the elderly and vulnerable has helped to drive down rates of hospitalization and death. And now we want to reinforce that protection with a second dose. So for many people, April will be the second dose month. And please take up your appointment when it's your turn. And at the same time as we push forwards with our programme to offer a vaccination to all adults by the end of July, we're building up our own long-term UK manufacturing capabilities. I, I've already told you that Novavax, a potentially significant new weapon in our armoury against COVID, is going to be made at Fujifilm in the, in the North East. And I can today announce that the Vaccine Task Force has reached an agreement with GlaxoSmithKline to finish and bottle uh, this precious fluid also in the Northeast, giving us between 50 and 60 million doses of UK max made vaccine subject to the right approvals from the MHRA. And then of course, there is one other way we can all build our own individual defenses against COVID and enjoy ourselves at the same time. And that is to take more exercise and so I'm personally thrilled that I will be able uh, to play tennis for instance and without being remotely preachy I do hope that we can take advantage of uh, this moment and the beautiful weather to play sport uh, to take exercise to have fun and build our national resilience in that way too and remember that outdoors is generally much safer than indoors and the way to continue on our cautious but irreversible roadmap to freedom is to follow the rules and remember hands, face, space and fresh air. Thanks very much. I'm now going to hand over to Chris for the slides. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, first slide, please. Uh, so the first slide shows the pattern uh, since September of the number of people testing positive for COVID uh, in the UK. And as you can see, this has dropped a long way from the peak in January, although it is now flattening out. And I'll come on to uh, why that is uh, in a minute. Next slide, please. Fortunately, the number of people in hospital in, with COVID in the UK is continuing to fall. Uh, and uh, as you can see, this is now down to uh, much lower levels than it was uh, last month and the month before that. Next slide, please. Uh, and the, uh, the best news really on this is that the number of deaths of people who had a positive test for COVID uh, in the UK uh, is continuing to fall. Uh, and the most recent seven day average is 63 deaths. Next slide, please. And this is partly 
due to lockdown, and a large part of this is due to lockdown, uh, but also partly uh, and increasingly due to the vaccine rollout. Uh, and this slide shows the steady uh, increase in the blue bars of people who've had their first dose of vaccine and in the uh, orange at the bottom, those who are having their second dose of the vaccine. And as the Prime Minister says, the number of people having a second dose is going to increase significantly over the next month. And it is essential that people do come for their second dose. Next slide, please. Uh, I thought we, would show, we should show um, two slides, really just to uh, put a little bit of uh, detail uh, on this. And the first of these uh, is to compare the age distribution of people who sadly have died from COVID on the left. And what you have is the ages steadily going up from zero to four at the bottom up to 90 at the top. And the red line uh, is the uh, point at which vaccination has reached. So it's reached down to those who are 50 and above, plus people who got pre-existing health conditions. The final uh, cases have been found, and I really want to stress that anybody who in that group, in those 50 or above, who has not been called for a vaccination should make contact with their uh, doctor. But, and this is an important but, uh, the, on the right, what we have is the total number of people who have actually uh, acquired COVID. Um, and as you can see on that, the great majority of people who have acquired COVID are actually younger than this. So the majority of transmission is in younger age groups who have not yet been vaccinated, uh, unless people have got pre-existing health conditions or they're a health or social care worker or care for someone who is vulnerable. So um, we therefore anticipate that as uh, there is gradual unlocking in the way the Prime Minister has described, it is uh, inevitable that there will be some increase uh, in the number of cases because the people who are most likely to catch and to transmit COVID are in that younger unvaccinated group. So the vaccination has had a really big impact on helping to protect against people dying from COVID, although it is not a complete protection, uh, but it ha will have less impact uh, on transmission because of this age um, distribution. Next slide, please. The second uh, new point I really just wanted to make, and then Sir Patrick is going to make a point uh, about vaccines, uh, is to say that the bit of the uh, roadmap op opening up that has happened so far is opening up schools. And what you can see on this, and I think this is likely to become clearer over the next uh, two weeks, is that there has been a steady decrease in the rates of COVID uh, over the last uh, several weeks in most age groups, but there's been a flattening and possibly even a slight uptick in transmission amongst people, uh, children of school age. This isn't a dramatic increase at this point, but this is inevitable that as bits of society open up, there will be some increases in transmission and we should expect that. That is uh, one of the things we have to anticipate will happen as some opening ups occur. Uh, so Patrick just wanted to make in some additional points on the vaccine. Thank you. Can I have the next slide, please? So a few points about vaccine. If you look at the left-hand part of this figure in the blue, this is giving an illustration based on the current and recent rates of infection across the community, roughly how many people you'd expect to be in hospital or to be hospitalised over a four-week period. So if you take the top age group in the 25 to 34 age group, out of 100,000 people in the population of that age, over a four-week period, roughly seven people would expect to be you'd expect to be hospitalised. If you go to the next age group, 35 to 44, so you took 100,000 people in the community over a month, four-week period, you'd expect roughly 14 people. 45 to 54, 21 people. And 55 to 64, 29 people. If you went to higher ages, of course, you'd get even more. So this just reinforces the point that as people get older, the risk of hospitalisation from infection is greater. Now, if you look at the right-hand side, this tells you what would happen if all of those people were vaccinated. 
So if everybody were vaccinated, and this is taking a single dose, so it's giving roughly an 80% prote uh, protection, you'd find that in the youngest age group there, 25 to 34, instead of there being seven people hospitalised over a month, it would be one or maybe two. 35 to 44, it, instead of it being 14, it would be two, three. As you go to the higher ages, 45 to 54, instead of 21, it would be four. And at the highest age group on this, 55 to 64, it would be roughly six people instead of the 29. So there are three points I want to make. First is the one that as you get older, there's a higher risk from this disease, as Chris has also shown. The second is that the vaccines are very effective at reducing hospitalisation in everyone who gets them. And so the message is, everybody who's asked to come forward for a vaccine, please get the vaccine. But the third message is that the vaccines are not 100% protective. And this is at the current rates of infection. If the rates were much higher, then obviously the amount of hospitalisation would be higher, which reinforces the point that the thing that we all must do is try and keep rates down and be sensible as we unlock and get back to more interaction. Thank you. Thanks very much, Patrick. Thank you, Chris. Let's go to Beatrice from London. With restrictions easing, people are slowly being reunited with their families. For those with family abroad, they have not been able to see them for months. Will a similar easing take place for those with family abroad? Or will seeing family be incorporated as an exception to international travel, like the exception to travel for business purposes? Well, Beatrice, thanks very much. I think that the, the most important thing that we've got to do right now as we uh, continue to immunise uh, great numbers of people in this country is, is protect our country insofar as we can. And it, it's never going to be perfect, but do as much as we can to prevent the virus coming back in from abroad and new variants uh, coming in from abroad. So the rules about uh, what uh, you can do, what people can do to see their families abroad will be governed entirely uh, by the rules that uh, cover uh, travel abroad and uh, people coming from abroad. So uh, at the moment, as you know, uh, it's still uh, forbidden to, to travel. Uh, we'll be saying uh, a bit more on April the 5th about what the, the uh, Global Travel Task Force has, has come up with. Uh, and um, clearly, th at the moment, it is, uh, you know, there are lots of uh, countries that are on a, a red list, uh, 35 countries on a, on a red list, uh, where we have very stringent uh, measures in place uh, for them, for people arriving from those countries, they have to go immediately uh, into hotel quarantine. And if you're coming from anywhere else, uh, you also face uh, pretty tough quarantine rules. So um, uh, we will be, Beatrice, we will be saying more about um, uh, seeing family abroad uh, and, and travel abroad, but it, it won't be until at least April the 5th. Any, any, anybody want to say any more on that? Thanks, Beatrice. Let's go to Julia from Margate. Uh, Julia asks, uh, myself and my husband have had our first dose of the Pfizer vaccine and are due to have our second dose at the end of April. Will this be impacted by the recent shortage of supplies and what does the government plan to do about it? Well, Julia, I think I can answer that question very uh, briefly and uh, succinctly by saying that, uh, that there isn't any need to worry about a uh, shortage of uh, Pfizer for the second uh, dose as, as far as we can uh, see at the moment. And uh, we're going to continue to, uh, to roll that out and, uh, and supply that. And as I said, April is going to be the, uh, the second dose month. Uh, very important that everybody gets their, uh, their second dose. Uh, Hugh Pimmer from the BBC. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Isn't there a danger of mixed messaging when you talk both about a roadmap to freedom and getting back towards normal life, but also the need to be cautious because of cases rising in some parts of Europe. And a question for Professor Witte and Sir Patrick Valence. How concerned are you about what's happening in some European countries with cases and what that might mean for the UK? And have you given your approval to the next stage of easing on April the 12th, the opening of outdoor hospitality and non-essential retail and so on? Well, thanks very much, Hugh. And you're absolutely right that the uh, we're 
pleased to be able to uh, to have some measure of uh, of relaxation today. It is important. It is valuable. I know, I know it will be prized by uh, by people, but also very important to stress that uh, we are continuing to be uh, cautious. And uh, the, the whole point about the uh, the roadmap and the timescale that we've got is it gives us a chance to evaluate the uh, the data as we go forward. And uh, as for the uh, for the April the the, the twelfth uh, phase, we'll be we'll be saying more about that in in due course. Obviously, same goes for May the seventeenth, uh, June the twenty first. They all depend on uh, on the four uh, on the four conditions. But I, I wonder whether uh, Chris or Patrick, you want to say more? Yes, what? sorry, oh, Patrick. sorry, no, Patrick. You go. Um, well, I, I think when we discussed the gap between stages, the idea was to have five weeks to allow data to be assessed in the fourth week which is the earliest we think we can get a good handle on what's happened. And so that's next week. So that's when the analysis of uh, the effects of the initial o opening of going back to school uh, can be assessed, and at that point we'll be able to give the recommendations. Uh, so far, as Chris has laid out, everything's moving in the right direction, but we need to do a formal data analysis next week. In terms of the, um, are, are we concerned about what's happening in Europe and elsewhere? Well, I mean, in those, uh, you know, Anybody would be concerned about any country in the world where rates are going up because that has a big impact on people's health and lives. So I think, you know, as, as citizens of the world, we will all be concerned about any of those countries. For the UK, uh, there are essentially there are two risks. There's always a higher risk. If any country has got a higher rate than you have, then there is a risk of net importation of, uh, of COVID. Uh, but the much bigger risk, and the one that we're all concerned about, is the risk of variants of concern. These are uh, COVID variants, which might, and I want to stress the word might, have a, a, a problem with the vaccine, where it would, the vaccine is less effective against them. And so the main thing we're concerned about is the risk of importing into the UK variants which uh, could have a reduced uh, effectiveness of the vaccines we're currently using. Uh, now, in the long term, there would be ways around that, but in the short term, that is the principal thing that's driving concerns about border issues at this stage. Uh, in terms of giving approval, uh, it's not really for uh, Sir Patrick or me to give approval of things, uh, but certainly we've been involved heavily in all the decisions uh, in terms of giving, giving technical advice to ministers. Thanks very much, Hugh. Colton and ITV. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, there's a great sense of release around the country today with the lifting of some restrictions. Uh, do you worry at all that uh, people might take that too far? And what sort of word of warning would you give people who are tempted that way? And for Professor Whitty, um, you showed us a graph of how uh, the reopening of schools more fully created a bit of an uptick. Do you worry at all that uh, today's relaxations could also eventually cause a bit of an uptick in the numbers of cases? And how well at this point do you think we are protected by the vaccination programme as a country? Carl, yes, you're absolutely right to put the emphasis on, on caution. Uh, the vaccine rollout has been very impressive and you know, thanks to everybody who's been involved in it. Uh, but what we, what we don't know is exactly how strong our fortifications now are, how, how robust our uh, defences are against uh, an, another wave. And we've seen what, what's been happening. That's why I stress what's happening with our European friends, because uh, historically, at least, uh, there's been a, a time lag and then we've had a a wave ourselves and that's why you know i just stress the importance of everybody maintaining the uh the the, the discipline that people have shown for so long and continuing with the the cautious uh but we hope irreversible uh roadmap that we that we've set out um in terms of the question you asked uh, me um, uh, yes, there is a high likelihood that there will be some uptick as a result of the uh, re um, relaxations today. And that was anticipated right from the beginning of trying to lay out where the roadmap would go. And if you think about the, the, gra the graph that I showed, what it shows is that the uh, high proportion of those who will both catch and transmit COVID have not been vaccinated yet. Uh, and uh, so I would not anticipate that uh, vaccination will reduce transmission between people in those ages at all at this point in time. But, and this is the big but, the point the Prime Minister was making and that's been stressed repeatedly is that if people stick to social distancing rules and they're outside, 
the risk of transmission is massively lower than if they are very close together and inside. So provided people are sensible about these and people throughout the entire COVID uh, pandemic in the UK have really been very sensible and incredibly uh, uh, sort of st respectful of sticking to the rules and guidelines. Uh, provided people stick to outdoors and at a distance if it's people who are not in their households, the impact on in terms of an uptick should be modest, but I, I think it would not be realistic to think there will be no impact and that is something we are uh, we're all aware of. The only thing just to add is it's important to remember as vaccination rolls out that once you've been vaccinated, it takes three weeks or so before you get some protection mm -hmm. from the vaccine. It's very important to recognise that even when vaccination, it's not an instant thing. It takes a time for the immunity to, to accrue. Brilliant. Thanks. Uh, Beth Rigby's Sky News. Thank you. Prime Minister, you've asked a lot of the British people over the past year, and now, even as that vaccination programme has rolled out and cases are now at their lowest level since last October, you are still hugely restricting our personal lives and our liberties. Do you accept that you are testing the patience of the public? And are you concerned that people will stop listening? And to Professor Whitty, with over 30 million adults now having received a jab, uh, you've said another COVID surge would be met with a wall of vaccinated people. With that in mind, are we really at risk of a third wave, the sort we're seeing in continental Europe? Or can the British people finally begin to relax? And just quickly to Sir Patrick, uh, when will the doses, those 50 to 60 million doses that the Prime Minister just talked about of the Novavax uh, vaccine, when would they be available? That's not for me, I don't think so. Uh, uh, let me let me go uh, straight back to you, Beth, on that that point about you know asking a lot of people. And yes, of course, I I accept that, and I know how much government has asked of 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 the, of the people in the last year. But I also know how magnificently, with what incredible uh, patience and fortitude, people have responded. And it's my view, Beth, that overwhelmingly people are determined to continue uh, to to do that, and they they do understand the need for for caution. Uh, and I think overwhelmingly people understand uh, that uh, when it comes to this roadmap, the more we, the better we stick to it, the more, the more cautious we are, the better the chance we have of making sure that it is indeed irreversible and we're able to, to go forward in the, in the way that we want. In terms of the question you asked uh, to me, um, what, what Patrick's uh, slide, I think, showed is that we do have a kind of a wall of vaccination that will get stronger with the second vaccines. And I want to repeat my emphasis. It is critical people get their second vaccine, but it is not a complete wall. It's a kind of leaky wall. Uh, and therefore, there will always be some people who either have chosen not to be vaccinated uh, or who, where the vaccine has had much less effect. Uh, and if we get a small surge, uh, there will be cases of people who have been vaccinated who will have uh, severe disease, and there will be cases of people who've who are not vaccinated, much higher proportion, who will get severe disease, and some of those will go on to die. If we get a very big wave, uh, that would obviously lead to a significant impact. So that's the reason why the Prime Minister and Ministers have been absolutely uh, uh, determined that this is a slow and steady uh, unlocking looking at data between each step because what we're trying we accept we accept that with this highly transmissible virus of course there will be an increase in transmission as we unlock vaccines will help hem it in as we go down the ages but it's going to take a while before we've got the full protection and even when we have there will be some upsurge the key thing is to keep that rate down and to make sure as many people as possible are vaccinated in particular the most vulnerable and, and keeping the rate down also stops the likelihood of more variants emerging. So it's important we keep on top of this. Um, the, the Novavax question about is an operational one about when that's delivered, and I can't answer that for you. But what I will say is that um, uh, Novavax hasn't been through the regulatory process yet, so it would need to do that as well before anyone can really be sure exactly when that would come. What I can say is that they are, are already making it at the... Uh, uh, at the site in, in Teesside, they're, they're already making the the vax pending the uh, the MHRA uh, approvals. Jason Groves, F, uh, Daily Mail. Thank you. Uh, Professor Whitty, uh, if someone's had both their 
vaccine shots, as many people now have, why shouldn't they hug their grandchildren this Easter? Are they not now as safe as they're going to be for the foreseeable future? And Prime Minister, you, you mentioned uh, uh, the encouraging signs on some of the graphs. The death rate now uh, is round about where it was uh, when we unlocked indoor socialising last year. If it was good enough to do that last year, why isn't it good enough to do that this year? Uh, do you want to do hugging first? Who's doing hugging? I'll, I'll, I'll take, uh, take that on. Um, the thing to understand with vaccines is they provide increasing levels of protection as we go through. The first vaccine provides a high degree of protection. The second vaccine for the same person provides greater protection, but there's still some vulnerability. This is the point that Patrick's slide uh, was making. Uh, then actually having uh, people around someone who has been vaccinated, who are themselves vaccinated, provides a further level of protection. And then keeping the key thing is keeping the rates right down makes it very unlikely that someone who comes in, even if they have, have been vaccinated, certain, so even if they haven't been vaccinated, and certainly if they have, uh, will actually have COVID and be able to pass it on. But what we're trying to do is get to the point where all of those protections are in place and we are not yet at that stage. We're getting there steadily. The extraordinary rollout by the NHS, I think, is really remarkable. Uh, and that is going through at a real pace. But the great majority of people have not yet had their second vaccine. And if they're meeting people who are under the age of 50, they will not have had their vaccination unless they actually have a pre-existing health condition or are a healthcare worker. Uh, I would like to um, re-stress um, a point that Patrick made also, which is that people are not immediately protected when they're vaccinated. Uh, and I think mm. it is important for people to remember that, that there is a period of time uh, of, uh, if you're an older um, citizen, maybe three weeks or so, um, uh, between the time that you get vaccinated and the time when the protection kicks in. Uh, it'll be good protection, but it won't be absolutely complete protection. I think that's an incredibly important point for everybody to, to remember uh, right now. And Jason, I think the answer is uh, to your question is really contained in some of the slides that we saw earlier, where you already, because of the, uh, the relaxation that we've seen, almost certainly because of the, uh, the opening of, of schools again, you're starting to see some of those uh, graphs starting to curl a bit like old British Rail sandwiches uh, moving upwards um, uh, a little bit in the, in the younger groups. Uh, in, you, you've seen what's happening in the, uh, uh, on the continent, uh, we, we, and we've seen that uh, happen before. That's why it's, it's so vital that, you know, we do what we're doing right now. We, we continue to, to fortify the, the population, roll out the, uh, the vaccine at the, at the speed that we, uh, that we are, uh, make sure, as, as, as Chris and Patrick say, everybody gets the, the second dose when they're, uh, they're asked uh, to, uh, to come forward uh, when they're given their turn. Uh, but, um, the, you know, just make sure that we are, are, are cautious in our approach. I think that's the, the, the way to get the results that we, that we want. Let's go now to Jasmine uh, Cameron Chileshi of the FT. Thank you. The Sport and Tourism Minister said earlier this morning that police would be able to intervene and fine any rule breakers where necessary. But how realistic is that? Will police officers be going around breaking up groups of more than six outside? Do you think that would be appropriate? And are you confident that the rules are clear enough to facilitate a consistent and fair approach to policing across the country? And secondly, as the number of coronavirus infections grows throughout Europe, why have countries like France not yet been added to the red list? And what is your response, Prime Minister, to concerns that throughout the pandemic, the UK has been slow to secure our borders from cases coming in from abroad? Thank you. Thanks very much, Jasmine. On the first point about uh, the policing, the police has done an absolutely outstanding job throughout this uh, pandemic, and I think they've handed out uh, about 70,000 fines at least for various breaches of one kind uh, or another, and I make no, you know, I make no apology uh, for for that. Uh, they will continue to uh, to do their best, but it depends more than uh, it depends on the piece. It depends on uh, general public understanding of what we've all got to do. And that, in a way, has been even more impressive. That's been the single thing that's made all this, uh, all this possible. On 
uh, the uh, imports of, of new variants from abroad and uh, our border regime. We have one of the toughest regimes in the, in the world. Some, some European countries, Jasmine, don't even have, uh, many European countries don't even have the hotel quarantine of the kind that we have in the, in the UK. And uh, there are 35 countries already on the, on the red list. Uh, we're looking uh, very closely at what's going on in, in France. We keep it under, under constant uh, review, of course. Though, as I've explained uh, to people before, there, there is the issue uh, that our, uh, our trade uh, in medicines and food uh, does depend uh, very much on those, on those short straights. So we have to make sure that we manage the disruption as well. Uh, thank you very much, Jasmine. Let's go to uh, Sophia Slay of the Evening Standard. Thank you. Prime Minister, you said that you want this unlocking to be irreversible. Can you categorically rule out another full lockdown? And my second question is for Professor Chris Whitty. An Evening Standard story today revealed that care home staff in London are the least likely to take up the vaccine. The lowest take up in the whole country is in Lambeth, where just 45 per cent of staff working in homes for the elderly have taken it up. Are you shocked by that figure? And do you think that level offers enough protection for residents? Well, uh, Sophia, I think the answer to your, your excellent question is, uh, is Yes, but with you know two at least two very important provisos. Uh, uh, yes, if everybody obviously continues to uh, obey the guidance with sufficient uh, caution, and we continue to work together uh, to keep the, the 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 virus under control and get it down in the way that we have. Uh, and yes, if the uh, the vaccine uh, rollout uh, continues and the vaccines continue to be as effective as it looks as though uh, they. Uh, could be, or looks as though they are, uh, Sophia. So those are the uh, the two conditions that would have to be uh, to be satisfied. But you know, I'm 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 hopeful. I think that we're, I don't see anything in the data right now uh, that would cause us to to deviate uh, from the from the roadmap. Um, but you know, we've got to remain humble in the face of, of nature, and, and we've got to be prepared to do whatever it takes to protect the British public, which has been our, our approach uh, throughout. Um, in, on the question uh, to me, um, the great majority, actually, of care home staff nationally uh, have um, had the vaccine, uh, and as have uh, an even greater proportion of our health uh, care staff. Uh, I think for those who don't, I, I think there are probably three things it's really important to stress. I mean, the first thing is this vaccine will protect you and your family. And I think it is important that people really understand that this is uh, of, it's important for everyone, but it's important for the individual who has the vaccine themselves and those around them. There's now uh, evidence that if you have a vaccine as a health or social care worker, it's likely that that is going to protect, uh, provide protection to your family. Second thing uh, is that there is, um, unfortunately, some uh, misinformation about vaccines and the key thing is to go to reliable sources uh, if you're hearing uh, stories about vaccines and you're concerned about them go to reliable sources uh, talk to uh, medical staff uh, who can actually lay out the facts because the you know compared to the risk of uh, covid the risk of the vaccines is much smaller and that's the whole point about all drugs and all vaccines is you're doing it because the risk of actually uh, not being vaccinated is substantially greater than the risk of being vaccinated. And the third point specifically on, on care staff, certainly uh, uh, when we're talking about medical or nursing staff, I've said before, and I will say very uh, unambiguously, uh, I do consider people who are looking after vulnerable uh, other people who are very vulnerable do have a res professional responsibility to get vaccinated and to do other things that help protect uh, the people who they're looking after. It's not just an issue about vaccination. This is across the board. Vaccination is one of those issues. Uh, and so it is important that people view it both for themselves, for their families, uh, but also uh, take their professional responsibilities seriously. Brilliant. I think that's it. anything to add, Patrick. No, thank you all very much. See you next time. See the headlines as they happen and watch BBC News live in the app and get the full story with bbc.co.uk forward slash news. Follow the story for all the latest with BBC News.